All right, so I want to work through this three-question review. Obviously, don't look at this till you've tried all the questions first. Um, I want to find the equation of this polynomial function. I can see there's an x-intercept at negative 2. I can see there's an x-intercept at positive 1, an x-intercept of 3. So I know my equation must have factors of x plus 2, x minus 1, and x minus 3. But if you look at how the function behaves around these x-intercepts, for example, around the x-intercept of negative 2, which is from my factor of x plus 2, I can see that's the behavior of a multiplicity of 3, which means this factor must repeat three times. Likewise, for this x-intercept of 1, it behaves like a quadratic function at that point. It looks almost like a vertex of a parabola, which means that's a multiplicity of 2. And the x-intercept of 3, it behaves like a linear function as it just kind of cuts straight through that. So that means that function does not repeat. Now, if we assume that's everything, we're probably jumping to a conclusion too quickly um, because there may be some sort of stretch right here. And so lastly, let me look at my y-intercept because um, I know the y-intercept is 3. And I know I can find the y-intercept of function, any function, by substituting x with 0. And for this equation that I have right now, if I just let x equal 0, um, I get a y value of negative 24, which means if this was it, if this was the complete answer, this should have a y-intercept of negative 24. It clearly doesn't, which means there are, there's some sort of coefficient in the front. Um, I know there must be a negative value in the front because I can see there's a vertical reflection, so there must be a negative number here. Um, but it has to go from negative 24 to positive 3, which is dividing by 8. So there must be a vertical reflection and a vertical compression by a scale factor of 1 8th. Easy to miss that. Um, but from just looking at the factors, I can't immediately assume I can see the entire function. But now I can see the entire function. All right, so now I have g of x, which is negative 3f of negative x over 2. What are the x and y intercepts for this? Well, first let's think about the transformations here. That negative 3 there is a vertical reflection and a vertical expansion by a scale factor of 3. And right here, I have a horizontal reflection as well as a horizontal expansion by a scale factor of 2. Because what we see right here, x divided by 2 is the same as x times a half. And so the reciprocal of a half is 2. And so now let's think about how this will affect the x and y intercepts. Let's start with the x-intercept. I can see the x-intercepts are at negative 2, 1, and 3. Well, the vertical transformations will have no effect on the x-intercepts. So I just need to focus on this horizontal reflection and horizontal expansion, which means all of these are going to have their signs change from a negative to a positive and vice versa, and all of them will be doubled because the scale factor is 2. So the x-intercepts of g of x must be 4, negative 2, and negative 6. I just took every single one of those values and basically multiplied by negative 2 or reflected it horizontally and then doubled it. For the y-intercepts, I need to pay attention to my, or y-intercept, I should say. There's only one y-intercept. I need to pay attention to my vertical transformations. So right now, the y-intercept of this is at 3. So if I reflect it vertically, it's now at negative 3. And then I vertically expand it by 3, it now becomes negative 9. So one y-intercept at negative 9. All right, uh, I want to look at this polynomial, sorry, this rational function, and I want to sketch it, showing any dis types of discontinuities. Well, I got a cubic function divided by another cubic function, and if I am going to be able to visualize this, I need to be able to factor it and see if it simplifies. And so to factor any sort of cubic or higher order polynomial, we first need to make an educated guess about what might be a factor. Uh, and whatever factors of this must be factors of the number 2. And so I'm going to make a guess, and I'm going to guess that x minus 1 is a factor. And I can check if that's right by replacing x equals 1 into that 
first equation, the one I've highlighted in yellow. And if you substitute x with 1, you get a 0 out, which means I know that x minus 1 is a factor. Hey, what do you know? It's almost like I knew that already. And so that means I not only know part of my factors, I can now take that cubic function, and I'm going to use synthetic division. So if I'm dividing by x minus 1, I want to put a 1 right here. Just write my coefficients down, 1, 0, negative 3, and 2, and then perform my synthetic division to see what's left. And of course, I got a 0 at the end. If I did not get a 0 at the end, that means I know I made a mistake. Because if I know x minus 1 is a factor, I must get no remainder. Which means when I divide by x minus 1, I have x squared plus x minus 2. So x minus 1 is part of that numerator. This is what's left. This is a quadratic function, and quite often I can factor it by just looking at it, and I can. Two numbers that multiply to negative 2 and add to positive 1 are negative 1 and positive 2. Which means the fully factored form of my numerator, and I'll kind of write that right here, is a factor of x minus 1 twice and x plus 2. There's my numerator. All right, I do need to do the same thing for my denominator, which is no harder, it's no easier, it's a, roughly the same amount of work. I don't think you need to watch me do all the steps. If you factor that properly, uh, you should get a factor of x minus 1 twice and a factor of x minus 4. All right, which means I can see this simplifies down to just x plus 2 over x minus 4. But I still have a restriction where x cannot equal 1, and as well, x cannot equal 4. All right, so now I have a much simpler function to try visualizing. So how do I graph x plus 2 over x minus 4? One thing I can tell right away is that there is a vertical asymptote at 4. And while I can draw that right away, why not? Um, I can't really draw much else. But. That's nice and quick. If I really want to get more detail out of this, I need to put this into a different form. And I want to write this into our more standard form for a simple rational function like this. And so I'm going to take that x plus 2 over x minus 4. And I want to create a factor of x minus 4. So I'm going to shove the plus 2 over here. And I now want to create a factor of x minus 4 here, which I can do as long as I put a plus 4 here. Now, technically, none of these are factors, but eventually I'm going to have a factor of x minus 4. Notice, uh, at this point, I have a messier version of what I had before, but I can now break this up into two rational expressions where I have x minus 4 over x minus 4 for one term plus 6 over x minus 4. And this is just 1, and so now I have my simplified expression of 6 over x minus 4 plus 1. Or I really shouldn't say so much simplified, it's just it's in a form that I can visualize much nicer. And so now I can see my horizontal asymptote. My horizontal asymptote is this constant here, plus 1, so I'm going to draw that. And I can see that compared to the graph of 1 over x, there is a stretch by a scale factor of 6, which means if I think about my graph here, if there was no stretch, it would go through this point and this point. But there's a stretch of 6, so it's going to actually go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 right there. Oh. Or... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this way. And once I have those two points, I have some corresponding points over here. So one point must be up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The other one's off my screen a bit. I can also put some more points in. Uh, going back to this quadrant down here, if I go 2 over, I should go 3 down. And then I have the sort of reflection there. Again, with these... Um, rational functions like this. There's lots of symmetry. And now I'm almost done. I have lots of points, more than enough points to visualize my function. However, all that's left is realizing there actually is a point of discontinuity in here. And I know that because right here, 
there was a factor of x minus 1 that cancelled out from the numerator and the denominator, which also led to my restriction right here at x equals 1, which means my graph looks like this, except when x equals 1, there's nothing there. And so I need to show that on here. Define where x equals 1. Now where x equals 1, oh, I erased a little too much, is right here. So I need to show this point of discontinuity. And right here, when x equals 1 and y equals negative 1, there's my point of discontinuity. And now my graph is complete. Right, last question. I have a graph here of i of x in blue and j of x is in red, in solid. Um, so I want the equation of j of i, in j of inverse of i of x, which keep in mind, it can also be written like this, j of the i inverse of 3 actually, not x. Oh, that's really messy. All right, fair amount to think about here. First, let's figure out the equation of function i, the one in blue, which is a radical function. Um, but there's a stretch, there's a horizontal, a horizontal reflection. In the end, the equation of that function i of x must be the square root of negative 2 times x minus 8. Or alternatively, um, actually, no, that, that's by far the nicest one. And so in terms of my transformations, I can see there's a horizontal translation, 8 to the right. It has been horizontally reflected, and there is a horizontal compression by a scale factor of a half. All right, so with that said, um, if I want to find just this part here, the inverse of i at 3, I don't actually have to find my inverse function. Um, one way of figuring this out is to realize that, okay, Finding the inverse of i at 3 is equivalent to finding where function i equals 3. So I can take this equation and make 3 my output and figure out, okay, what has to go in. Alternatively, I could actually find the equation for the inverse of function i and then substitute 3 into that, but this is going to be less works. And so I have just, again, putting 3 into an inverse, same as 3 coming out of, in this case, i. And so I'm going to square both sides, so I get 9 equals negative 2x uh, plus 16. Solve for x. Pretty quickly, I'll just save you the time. You get x equals 3.5. So that means I know the inverse of i at 3 is 3.5. So maybe I'll save it right here. The inverse of i at 3 is 3.5. And now that is what goes inside function j because now I want to find j at 3.5. And so how do I do that? The fastest way is just look at my graph. Function j is in red, and when x equals 3.5, um, one option is to kind of look right here, which for j is down here. Um, and so it looks like it's at neg it looks like it's at um, sorry, what function am I looking at here? Function is in red. Um, yeah, it looks like it's at negative 3. Um, and if I'm not sure, I could just take that 3.5 and put it inside this equation here and then make it negative. But either way, um, this here I can see is going to be negative 3. All right, sorry, I feel like I made a mistake here, but usually when I think that, well, usually I did make a mistake, but I think we're all good here. I'm just double checking. Um, uh, J is in red, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna trust myself here. And so lastly, what's the domain and range of the square root of the inverse of J? Okay, um, and so first, uh, if I, I wanna, Think about what is the in, what does the inverse of j look like, and so the inverse of j, I can think of as a reflection of function j here. Now keep in mind j, and this is where I was kind of screwing myself up here. J is the one in red. I'll label it right here, j of x. So I want to find the inverse of this, and one of the nicest ways of doing that is just pick a few points, 
and swap around those coordinates. And so the inverse of this, I'll draw in purple, it will look like this. Go through that point, it'll go through here, and it'll go through here. All right, so this here is the inverse of J. All right, I want the square root of that. So when I square root a function, uh, I need to realize that anywhere my function was negative, the square root of it will no longer be real. Um, and for this whole section here, when we square root a function, we're just taking the y values and square rooting them. So for example, this highest point at 8, when I square root it, that'll be at root 8, So which is roughly around here, root 8. And if I do the same thing for these other points, I'll get a shape that looks roughly like this. Now, the question didn't actually ask for me to square root this, or sorry, just to visualize the graph, but it's not a bad thing. Um, but now that I've visualized the graph, what I have is what I want to find the domain and range of. So I can see the domain is only from negative 4 to 0. And the range is just from 0 at the lowest to root 8 being the highest. All right, a tough question. All these questions are tough questions, but these three questions do connect to all the big ideas of the unit. Hence, they're tough.